Welcome to TVBS Meeting Room, where we tackle global issues with a view from Taiwan. I'm your host, Wen Chi Yu. Joining us today is my good friend, Ambassador Kurt Tong, who is well known uh, in Washington, D.C. as a veteran diplomat versed in Indo-Pacific affairs, including economic trade and business issues. He's a former U.S. ambassador to APEC, one of the very few policy forums that Taiwan is a member of. He's also a former U.S. consul general to Hong Kong and Macau during the 2019 and 2020 protests that consequently changed Hong Kong's relationship with Beijing and the world. Welcome, Kurt. Pleasure to be here, it's, and it's fun to be with you, Wenchi. So, Taiwan has been in the spotlight in Washington, D.C., mostly for national security reasons lately. Uh, the growing attention could be a double-edged sword for Taiwan if viewed purely from military and defense perspectives. And you actually have offered some creative ideas by incorporating Taiwan into the broader economic and trade framework. Can you share with our audience some of your thoughts? Sure. Um, in my own belief is that as part of the effort of keeping the the entire region, um, East Asian region, stable and prosperous, it's important for Taiwan as a major economic player in the region to be incorporated into the structure and function of, of the region um, to the maximum extent possible, given the, the political realities. And that that in fact, is something that is beneficial to Taiwan, but also beneficial to the other uh, economies in the region, and in fact, beneficial uh, to the PRC. And so by nature, the deepening of, of economic linkages among the, uh, among the, the economies of the region is, is important for stability, prosperity, but also it has a geopolitical imperative um, associated with it as well. And one of my, frankly, frustrations as uh, someone who's worked in this field for, for some years is that the, the headline attention is often given to military affairs um, and diplomacy, which is entirely justifiable. And I'm not saying that those should be downplayed in their importance whatsoever. But the missing piece often is putting together the fact that these um, economies, Taiwan, the PRC, the other the other uh, players in the region, are also you know, very much intertwined economically and want to be even more so. And that the 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 urge to merge, if you will, among economies is very strong. And that's something that should be acted on by policy leaders in order to help the the overall geopolitical laydown. But you you actually have been in Washington, D.C. for your life pretty much as well, other than the, the time spent abroad. So you know how D.C. works. Um, you know, if it's not urgent, if it's not considered, you know, uh, sort of attention drawing, it's really hard to get people's sort of, you know, the, the attention and eyeballs. And so... Uh, some people would argue sort of, you know, viewing Taiwan from this purely military and defense kind of perspective gives people, especially Congress, the sense of urgency to actually think about Taiwan's role in the region. But, you know, there are also many others who worry that there's too much conversation around Taiwan, just about conflict or the pot potential war between U.S. and China actually puts Taiwan in a more dangerous place. Um, and that's kind of become not just about Taiwan, sort of the broader conversation when it comes to US and Asia. It's less emphasized, you know, in terms of broader relationship, but it's really about the conflict with China. How can we shift that conversation? So it's so the US is not viewing Asia just only about China or just about a potential war over right. you know and, and my own belief is that that there are multiple reasons why there should be more focus on, on the economic policy aspects. Perhaps most importantly, because Taiwan, um, people of Taiwan have an, the ambition and capability to be important players in, in, the, in regional economic policy. And that, as I said, helps lead to um, stabilization of the overall 
situation. And it gives also gives Taiwan voice and, and agency in in how things are happening. Less of a victim that needs protection. Correct. Right. And and more of a of an asset that everyone wants to be exactly involved with or or, or a a a, um, a a strong economy that everyone respects and, and wants to participate with in creating growth rather than than just a, a piece of property uh, over which the over which sovereignty concerns are, are exercised and and to the detriment of Taiwan in my view exercised by the great powers rather than Taiwan having voice. So I've been an, a, a consistent advocate for a decade or more of doing a formal binding a full bells and whistles free trade agreement mm -hmm. between the United States and Taiwan. Now, free trade agreements are very much out of fashion in, in Washington with uh, a lot of, of uh, concern in both parties, in the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party, about whether free trade agreements have been a benefit to the United States. Can you elaborate <laughs> more on that? Like, what are the concerns about bilateral or even multilateral trade agreements in D.C. these days? So the main concern is that that at the same time that the United States was was liberalizing access to its market and uh, working with other economies to make their uh, investment environments more favorable, uh, there was a, a sharp decline in manufacturing in the United States. And the academics debate this constantly about whether the this is cause and effect that the trade liberalization and resulting globalization of the activities of multinational enterprises was is the is the main driving factor in um, the decline in manufacturing in the U.S. or whether that is actually mostly explained by technological change new processes coming online, and then also the just the basic wage differentials that are very difficult to get around because the U.S. Essentially, is it's the debate about whether trade helps create American jobs or not. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And, and so pro-trade economists have lots of models and explanations about how um, opening markets in net terms helps the United States economy and leads to more jobs and more growth. <clears throat> the difficulty is that the, the benefit of trade liberalization is spread widely around an economy, including lower priced goods and mm -hmm. employment being created in new parts, new parts of the country or new sectors or new cities. At the same time, less competitive, older sectors um, will feel pain from liberalization and that pain tends to be quite localized. And because it's localized, it becomes politically relevant and very important. So this is why, this is the fundamental reason why Hillary Clinton and, um, and Trump both in 2016 ran against the Trans-Pacific Partnership that the Bush and Obama, Obama administrations had carefully um, created over the course of a decade to fit exactly the needs of the United States on trade policy. And then there was this big, um, you know, from my perspective, disaster where the US, which had spent a decade creating a comprehensive binding and high quality trade agreement that was designed to benefit an advanced economy like the United States, walked away from that agreement that they actually helped create. But then applying this to the Taiwan situation, the, the merits of a Taiwan um, FTA are both political and economic. So one can one can make the, a strong case that mm -hmm. there would be a minor improvement in um, the volumes of trade between the U.S. and Taiwan, uh, and um, and some increase in income in both countries as a result. But but the other benefit would be formalizing the idea that Taiwan is a full player in the global economy by having additional um, free trade agreements, just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. well, Taiwan has two of them with Singapore and New Zealand, but having one with the United States, the largest economy in the world, would reinforce the notion that this is a normal thing to do. 
which then reinforces the notion that Taiwan is an economy that everyone wants to play with. And, and, that, and that stability is important because of the economic value of all that commerce. So I'm, this is why I've been advocating it. Now, not to go on too long on this, Wenchi, but Congress has actually been quite interested in this. And there have been numerous uh, congressional letters with, okay. with dozens, um, sometimes more than 100 signatures saying, we should do one of these agreements with Taiwan mostly because it's a counter to uh, China's China. uh, efforts to coerce Taiwan regarding the ultimate question of Taiwan's sovereignty but 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 also you know for the economic purposes as well and so the, I think there's a there's a political opportunity in the US precisely because of the PRC pressure to um, act on this and do a binding agreement so Biden, the Biden administration has said it's not interested in, in any of these, but but I think that with with consistent effort, this could get put on the agenda. So tell us why, right? I, I think there's really no better time to actually talk about doing anything with Taiwan uh, just because of the political climate in Washington, D.C. So, you know, actually, the, the administration did launch a U.S.-Taiwan bilateral trade agreement uh, dialogue. Uh, we don't know where it's going, to be honest, um, but what are the main hurdles in the possibility of actually reaching a trade agreement if politically it is a constructive thing to do? Right. So looking at the short term, the opportunity for Taiwan is that the administration did launch um, what it's calling a, uh, sorry, I'm going to sneeze a second, 21st century initiative on US Taiwan trade. And so this is a is a um, narrowed down sort of light version of, of a trade agreement. It doesn't include tariff reduction, which is the thing for which you need congressional support. And the agenda is shorter than a full-fledged trade agreement and some of the non-tariff issues as well. Um, but it is valuable. So in the near term, what's needed is for the, the negotiators on the two sides to work really hard on this, try and get it done quickly um, within the, the term of the Biden administration in order to avoid any political turbulence, get the thing signed and, and then move forward, hopefully to, to more ambitious steps thereafter, which could include, like I said, a full FTA or um, a concerted effort to have Taiwan join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Hmm. The, uh, uh, but in the near term, the, the key thing is for Taiwan to really use this opportunity to figure out what are all the issues that, that foreign economies see in the Taiwan economy and address those in the context of this U.S.-Taiwan negotiation. So, and there are such issues. Um, the, a good guide to that is to look at the U.S. American Chamber of Commerce uh, position papers, Taiwan Chambers papers saying here's where the problem areas are. Um, one of the ones that that I encounter as a business consultant is questions around transparency and fairness in in Taiwan's regulatory handling of foreign investment, um, including in the financial sector and and mm -hmm. in some other areas, um, and whether the the decisions for approval of new businesses are being made in a fully transparent and non-political way. But there are other, other issues that are that are important and, and to, to act on and make and make the the Taiwan's external economic relations smoother, more perfect. So um you know the again coming back to sort of why Washington DC um is viewing Taiwan as it is now, obviously because of the China factor. Um, even in the economic realm, um, it's viewed more important uh, economically now because of the semiconductor industry. Right. Um, there's even this term sort of Silicon Shield uh, in Taiwan because of semiconductor and also the largest uh, producer of chips uh, in the world, TSMC. Um, but, you know, if you haven't heard, uh, it's a huge concern in Taiwan. Uh, when TSMC announced its uh, billions of dollars investment in Arizona, 
Um, Taiwan is concerned that there's the hollowing out effect uh, with TSMC, you know, relocating thousands of engineers to hiring thousands of engineers in Arizona. Um, what is your view? Um, there's even a saying that Taiwan is now being sacrificed uh, for the U.S. attempt to revitalize its own chip production. Yeah, that's a great question. The, you know, and the fact that Taiwan, in particular TSMC, it is such a strong um, player in the in the semiconductor supply chain. It's not the only player, and it's not the only step in the process. It's important to remember that. But it is it is the the um, strongest player at in, in at a in a key step in the process, the fab level, um, that uh, cuts both ways. So on the one hand, it, it makes um, people who are worried about the risk of Taiwan um, getting involved in a in a in a uh, violent confrontation or military confrontation with uh, mainland China as as uh, you know as a problem to be solved by moving that capacity elsewhere, but at the same time the the Silicon Shield concept, as you said, would be that that it would be harmful to the Chinese economy as well as everyone else's economy if this key link in the supply chain was was abruptly um, cut off. So in that context, I actually think that TSMC, my own view is that they've handled this whole matter quite astutely um, by maintaining significant capacity and um, particularly that some of the more cutting edge capabilities in Taiwan, but also investing um, heavily in the United States and then also in Japan and uh, perhaps in other locations and, and hedging as a corporation, hedging their, their, um, their, um, uh, their investment portfolio around various risk scenarios, but also um, maintaining a strong presence in Taiwan. And um, so I'm, I'm generally of the mind that this problem often gets overblown mm. uh, and, uh, and, and, and and lots of people talking about it in order to try and leverage specific outcomes that are a benefit to their countries or their companies. Um, but the overall situation to me seems more uh, more stable and and uh, balanced than is often um, trumpeted. Well, it certainly uh, it is played up in Taiwan as a domestic political issue, right? The opposition party. Uh, use this as a as a way to attack uh, the ruling party. Um, worried about again hollowing out effect. Um, and this this is whole semiconductor revitalization through the Chips Act uh, in the U.S. Congress that passed uh, a couple months ago um, has been fascinating because it's tied to what we just discussed in terms of you know how the domestic U.S. Um, mindset has changed when it comes to trade and globalization. And so, you know, what we're seeing increasingly is that the Biden administration has adopted a um, industrial policy approach to right. many sectors that are viewed as uh, critical to national security, including semiconductor, uh, but not just semiconductor, but also green energy. That's what we're seeing. There's this few between US and EU, you know, exactly because of the US, um, another uh, major legislation, Inflation Reduction Act that subsidizes a lot of the, you know, EV making, etc. So as someone who has worked in the sort of free economy, sorry, free market um, approach for a long time and advocating for that approach because of what U.S. stands for. How do you think about it, um, both domestically as well as, you know, internationally, how the U.S. talks about um, global economy? Right. And going back to the prior point, I wasn't taking any partisan position in Taiwan politics, just to be clear, between the incumbent or the opposition um, parties or candidates, just stating my own view on the on TSMC's um, rather um, well thought out strategy. The, the um, I think the US has, has bit off a lot um, in 
the last couple of years in trying to supercharge specific as strengths in the U.S. economy um, through government policy and um, particularly the the Chips Act and other industrial policies that you cited are, you know, pretty significant departure from uh, previous policies. Not entirely different. I mean, the U.S. has done other programs. You know, the space program is often cited as a as a, a leading edge investment in specific technologies that then led the economy in a certain direction. And mm -hmm. defense expenditure does the same thing. But the the uh, this emphasis on on chips and on green investments is is significant. Um, I think it, the the outcome is likely to be a mixed bag. Um, there inevitably will be more, for example, semiconductor factories built because of the uh, uh, the government investment and co-investment in, in, in the facilities than there would have been otherwise. But whether this will happen quickly, smoothly, efficiently, um, I think that the jury's out because there are, there's, the U.S. is, is not a, an, does not have an economy that is dominated by state-owned enterprise, uh, nor by heavy government intervention in, mm -hmm. on the, on the, uh, the investment side of things. I mean, the U.S. government has generally shaped its policy primarily through tax incentives um, and things which are are rather easy to um, uh, incorporate into business plans and lead to you know, changes in economic in investment plans and structure, but not but in a you know smoother and more efficient way than kind of project by project throwing money at stuff. And uh, so I think it's gonna be a mixed bag. I think I think it'll be, and, and, and looking back on all this um, 10 years from now, people will say, yeah, this, this accomplished some stuff. Um, was that use of $50 billion better than an alternative use, um, for example, in education or in something else uh -huh. that helped the economy? They're, they'll be debating it. It won't be, it won't be like crystal clear that this was a, a superb idea. Yeah. I mean, it is indeed a, a pivotal moment, I think, for the United States, just given its own domestic um, manufacturing, you know, capability, as well as all that's going on in the world. So um, it's interesting um, to see sort of this kind of approach and economic policy. Yeah, um, there's, now, there's two, deep, two deeper things going on here, too, once you I just point out. One is that the government is less trustful of business to make good decisions by itself. That's a political thing mm -hmm. rather than a, an economic thing. Business is doing the same thing it's always done, but government, public trust in government is lower and government trust in business is lower. And all of that creates this. Can we, can we define it as like bigger businesses rather than all businesses? Or are, or are you talking about just raw? Broadly um, focus on bigger businesses, but mm -hmm. but um, but frankly, you know all businesses, and and it's it's uh, um, less supportive. Uh, and yeah, I think you and I remember the time when Wall Street, Silicon Valley, were very welcomed in Washington D.C. But these days, I'm not sure if they're really welcome, at least in public. Is that right? Um, my, do much less so than previously. Yes. Um, and that has pros and cons. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's different is an, the emphasis that you sense on economic security and avoiding risk mm -hmm. as opposed to um, promoting opportunity. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that that's, um, you know, based upon a number of things that have happened, uh, the unemployment rate is low, um, so there's less sense of, of a driving need to help businesses create new jobs. Mm. One um, but there's also just a, a broader um, uh, uh, pessimism um, that pervades uh, American political thinking these days. Um, 
which I think is, you know, anyways, we don't need to get into a political philosophy discussion, but there's a lot of things driving that that kind of uh, atmosphere of anger and pessimism in, in Washington. I, th I think it's important to explain to people who don't live in the U.S. Um, that so much of it is um, really driven by domestic politics. If you look at the Trump administration and the campaign that he ran on, sort of the America first uh, slogan, to be frank, you know, if you look at what the Biden administration is doing, it's not that different, right? It's about prioritizing jobs in the United States, bringing industries back to the United States, um, and, you know, because American security, whether it's military, economic or defense, uh, trumps everything else. So there's definitely that sort of risk averse rather than, you know, outwardly thinking about bringing the benefits and prosperity to the other parts of the world, because, you know, the U.S. has to take care of itself first. Um, and, and I think that political transition um, is palpable. Um, it, especially, you know, for us living in Washington, D.C. Um, I, I want to bring, you know, another really important topic to this conversation um, because you were the U.S. Consul General to Hong Kong and Macau, um, another sort of financial hub or, you know, maybe yesterday's um, liberal uh, hub during the time when many Hong Kongers took to the street to protest China's role in Hong Kong's uh, governance. What was it like during that time, um, especially, you know, what, what were some of the most difficult decisions or communication you've had to make as the most senior U.S. official in Hong Kong? The um, and one point of clarification, when you introduced me, you um, gave me credit for being in Hong Kong in, in, in 2020 and I left in the summer of 2019. Um, OK, right. Right after the two large peaceful demonstrations of June 2019. And just as the more violent um, and more more uh, sort of uh, uh, directly anti-China and provocative demonstrations were just starting. Um, mm -hmm. But going to your question, the, the challenge that I found was uh, messaging in multiple directions as the US rep in, in Hong Kong. I was messaging towards the United States that Hong Kong is a valuable platform for um, US values, business, um, access to China uh, and regional operations um, of, of various kinds, including uh, particularly finance, but also other elements of business and uh, educational matters, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, messaging towards uh, Beijing that the uh, that this was a the formula that they had had, had established by Thatcher and Deng Xiaoping uh, to give Hong Kong a high degree of autonomy was valuable to foreign countries but also valuable to China. And that essentially this is a win-win formula that should be, that concerted efforts should be made to preserve and maintain mm -hmm. confidence in the, the idea that, that this formula was, was working. Um, and, uh, and so I actually made statements saying, you know, one country, two systems is a success in Hong Kong. Let's keep it up. It was the basic message that I was sending to Beijing. Uh, and to the and then to the people in Hong Kong and the government there was messaging, you need to keep using your autonomy in order to maintain strong autonomy muscles as a as a as an economy and as a government. So that's the milieu that I operated in. And what happened in, in 2019, 2020 was a, 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 a sharp drop in um the confidence of the Hong Kong people in the system mm -hmm. had been established, a sharp drop in Beijing's tolerance for Hong Kong being a very different place than the rest of China, and, and then a loss of, of confidence 
and 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 quite quickly a, an adversarial approach from the United States towards yeah. China's um, management of Hong Kong affairs, where uh, the focus was not on on what was had been done right and what could continue to be done right, but rather exclusive focus on what China was doing wrong. Mm -hmm. So things kind of fell apart. And um, and probably the and, worst outcome anybody would hope so for. The question now is here in, in 2023, what is the what is the situation in Hong Kong and and um, uh, and how will what will Hong Kong feel like and be going forward? Because um, it has, there has been a big transition in the city. Uh, I visited there recently and found that the the biggest change was in politics. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, there the the um, you know, democratic processes and governance always were kind of a, had a little bit of a tenuous hold in mm -hmm. Hong Kong. It was not a, a core part of how the the city was organized under the the sino-british um arrangement um but the most of the vestiges of 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 uh genuine elections and um and the use of the legislative council as a check on the power of the uh, executive has, has diminished to a, a point of not really being felt um and then public participation in political matters has dropped precipitously because a lot of it is now illegal mm -hmm. um, if, if public public activity in opposition to the government can be interpreted as um, as uh, questioning the legitimacy of the government which is now essentially illegal and when, mm -hmm. whether that's prosecuted or not is is in the judgment or in the hands of the of the government so that's big change right big change if you look at the other extreme and how's the business environment, you, you don't feel as, as much change. Um, the, the, you know, during this period, while assets under management in Singapore have increased sharply, mm -hmm. they've also increased in Hong Kong. And reflecting the fact that, that from a business perspective, and in particular, when one is choosing between doing business or investing in Hong Kong versus the mainland, if that's the choice that one is presented with, Hong Kong still doesn't look that bad. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the legal framework, uh, the operating rules, the, the currency of, of, of use is a hard currency. Um, the financial markets are very sophisticated. They continue to work. Um, infrastructure is, continues to be good. Crime is low, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's still a decent place to, to live and work. Um, as long as you're not interested in politics, mm -hmm. uh, and so that is 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 a a big question mark. I think you know, now from a Taiwan perspective, people are going to focus on the negative, and that's probably entirely appropriate from from Taiwan's perspective, the perspective of Taiwan people confronted with the idea that China wants to hurry reunification from China's perspective. Um, but then there is this alternative reality, which is that the, the Hong Kong continues to function as an economy, um, not, ex not entirely as it did before, but to a significant extent as it did before. And that, that's going to be, people are going to be puzzling over this yeah. puzzle, puzzle for, for in the coming uh, months. And yeah, I think the question is fundamentally, is this going to be better for people in Hong Kong or not? Um, and that, um, you know, what happened to Hong Kong at that time actually had a major impact on Taiwan's uh, 2020 presidential election. Right. Um, it actually frightened Taiwanese people, in fact, uh, what happened to Hong Kong in terms of one country, two system. It's not even a consideration now <laughs> um, in, in the Taiwanese, you know, sort of public arena. So um, there is also this... And, and the issues that went here are... The, the the what was what was created to me what the the changes of 2020 um, solidified is the understanding of one that that the PRC will place political stability above 
economic anything else yes value, anything else including rather high priority on economic performance and hong kong being a key part of that performance uh and then and then the question about whether the the uh, prc is trustworthy in in promises that it makes uh to in specific situations which mm -hmm. you know there, there's um there is a another you know set of opinions on this which i'm not going to reflect to a, a Taiwan audience saying that that it was the Hong Kong people that broke the trust, but I'm not going to pass judgment mm -hmm. on that today. But the the um, but it it is I think from the perspective of the people of Taiwan looking at the situation entirely natural for them to focus on the the um, uh, the negative um, perception of of Hong Kong's transformation into a a different kind of successful economic city than it was yeah. previously. And, and I think a valid uh, question raised by many in Taiwan um, was also what's the alternative, right? Uh, if increasing trade and business ties with China is actually not a guarantee of Taiwan security, which was uh, the argument by some, um, then, then what is it? Right, because China is still the largest trading partner to Taiwan, so um, it is a difficult uh, conundrum for Taiwan because Taiwan still needs economic growth. Um, and the broader, so, the broader, last... question, the broader question for Taiwan is, is in, in viewing and Hong Kong is an important data point on this, but not the only data point is how tolerant is is China on constraints placed on, on its freedom to maneuver according to its wishes. And uh, and how much does it value international connectivity and, and smooth relations externally versus um, domestic political prerogatives? And that, that I think is a, is a big important question. And of course, in, in the context of Taiwan, it makes absolute sense for Taiwan to, to explore promotion of PRC tolerance in the minds of the PRC leadership, but at the same time uh, uh, have a strong deterrent against um, aggression. And and that's a that's a balance that I think Taiwan uh -huh. Taiwan leadership has struck skillfully over the, over the years. Uh, but brings me back to the initial point of our conversation is that one of the ways to to um, strengthen the incentive for uh, tolerance, if you will, by the PRC side is strengthening of economic um, relationships. Well, um, and brought me. I don't, I don't see it as an open and shut case one way or the other, that there needs to be a, a, a specific choice between engagement with, with an, across straits economically, for example, and maybe I may be counter to much opinion in Taiwan in saying this, but having those that those stronger relationships at the same time as a strong military deterrent, um, do not to me do not seem incompatible. Well, the other thing is um, broadening its economic uh, engagement with the world when. Um, you know, it, it's permitted. So APEC, uh, you were the U.S. ambassador to APEC 12 years ago when the U.S. actually hosted APEC. Um, and this year, U.S. is hosting APEC again. It's a really important economic forum for Taiwan. Um, what would be your advice to Taiwan to take full advantage of U.S. hosting this year? Um, I think Taiwan should, should be an active, creative, thoughtful, and substantive participant in APEC. And it has been over the, over the years. Um, but with the U.S. in the chair, it's a particularly good opportunity for Taiwan to propose ideas, um, suggest specific ac APEC activities. Um, and, and the U.S. as chair is going to be inclined to be supportive if they're good ideas. Um, and it may be easier to pursue those ideas in a, in a U.S. chaired year than, than if, if it's chaired by a different uh, a different country that doesn't feel as empowered um, to move things along. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's a, a, a good opportunity. I think at the same time, one of the best pieces of diplomacy done by my predecessors back in the in the um, in in the nineties was 
coming up with a formula for simultaneous participation by the PRC, um, Taiwan, and, and Hong Kong in APEC. And I think that needs to be carefully maintained and cultivated mm -hmm. um, through essentially using a precedent uh, to drive how how the uh, how the the three participants the the three Chinese speaking participants in in uh, in APEC uh, act in the forum and there's a little bit of push and pull and things but there's but there's strong precedent driving how how affairs are conducted so as long as that those would be the two things I would say is just stick to precedent and then and then be creative and and thoughtful and substantive on the programming. Well, thank you for your advice on so many fronts to Taiwan. Um, you know, thank you for speaking to us, um, sharing your wisdom and uh, creative ideas. And hopefully, uh, you know, we'll see you in Taiwan sometime soon. Um, and thank you again. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye bye.